Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. So today we have with us a guest that's experienced two different sides of the coin. He's a medical device sales rep. So we're going to talk about medical device sales in the cardio space. But this is a representative who has experienced the 1099 life and experienced the W2 life and has also been in orthopedics and now cardio. His name is Steel Lightfoot, and it's a great episode because we're going to get into the rigor of the day-to-day when it comes to being in the ortho space or the cardio space, and also what it looks like in your day-to-day when you're 1099 versus a W-2. So for those of you that want to enter the industry, this is a great episode to listen to because it's going to really give you some things to consider about what life could look like. For those of you that might be in pharmaceutical sales or a different type of medical sales and you want to get into the device space in either orthopedics or cardio, again, this type of episode is going to be valuable because we get into the details. As always, I do my best to bring you guests that you can learn from, get insights from, and either make decisions about how you're going to get into the industry, what you're going to do to excel once you're there, or how to lead better for those of you that are leading the way. So thank you again for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast and let's get into it. Hey, Steele, how are we doing today? Doing great, Samuel. How are you, man? I'm fantastic. Uh, you know, 2021, and we already started with so much action. Can you believe it? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> um, so, you know, today we have with us Steele Lightfoot. And you know what, Steele, I'm going to let you go ahead and just introduce yourself. Tell people who you are and what you do. I appreciate that, Samuel. First off, thanks for thanks for having me on, man. What you're doing is is vital to our industry and and getting the word out for people who are curious and want to be educated a little bit more. So, yeah. um, like you said, my name uh, Steel Lightfoot. I, uh, I'm in the southeast. I work for uh, a cardiovascular company selling um, balloons and stents and all of the accessories that go with those procedures uh, in coronary and peripheral cases. Got it. Got it. So, you know, one question I get a lot is, what is the day to day of of someone that's in the cardio space in medical device sales? Why don't you give us a little bit about your day to day? Well, it's a funny question during the times that we're in now, I know, but I know. you know, so I'll I'll give you two answers here, and I'll I'll, right. I'll keep it uh, brief on both. But you know, pre COVID, a day to day is usually an early start, just like most medical device reps, um, and you're going and covering cases. Uh, you you've pre planned the night before, or even further back, and you're supporting your physicians and the cases you have on the board for the day. Uh, in throughout your day, while you're while you're covering these cases, uh, you're you're taking calls, you're you're answering orders, uh, you're trying to put out fires wherever they're needed, and you're you're planning your sales strategy around that too. Okay. Um, you know, medical device is a very unique field where a lot of sales calls are not in clinic. And then you're not interrupting a doctor or a surgeon while they're trying to see 40, 60 patients a day. You usually catch them in their surgical space, whether it's a a cath lab for me or um, what they call an office-based lab or an OBL, uh, ASC type setting, or an OR for most medical device reps. You're catching these doctors between cases while you're seeing them or bumping into them and, you know, trying to, trying to pick off some, some business here and there when it comes to picking their brain. So, you know, covering cases is, is really vital to what we do. Um, it's also, it can be a, a cord sometimes that you don't wanna to get too attached to, otherwise you lose sight of what you're trying to do, which is sure. hit your quota and, and move the needle forward. So um, usually towards the end of the day, towards the afternoon, most surgeons don't really work in the afternoons uh, in, in most disciplines. And so you get to a point where you need to start actually doing your sales calls that you have pre-planned if you you know hadn't got to them, and then you know I do a lot of wrapping up towards the end of my day with uh, answering the emails that I hadn't gotten to because I was in a lab you know doing my my job and couldn't answer them, and then you know it's a reset 
for for the next day. So it's it they're pretty busy. So you know, that's pre-COVID, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what we're doing now is is a lot of the same, but much less case coverage. And we're having to adapt the way we sell now um, compared to way the way we've used to. So this is this is a, a paradigm shift for medical device sales, in which now if you are not educating yourself to be um, proficient at virtual selling, you are sure. missing the boat. You're missing the boat. Sure. Um, this is something that's not going away, even when COVID does. Yeah. So we are perfecting our craft when it comes to how to meet our patients and our customers' needs from my office most of the time. Now, I'm still in the field three or four days a week and being careful where I can and safe where I can uh, covering cases. But a lot of it is strategizing behind my computer nowadays. Got it. So, so because of COVID and what's going on, would you say that surgeons don't necessarily need you to be there at all? I, I wouldn't agree with that at all. I mean, okay. a lot of surgeons need us there. Okay. Um, it's just how they do it. You know, a lot of surgeons are trying to look out for their own practice first and, you know, their, their practices are declining because patients aren't wanting to come right. in. And yeah. you look at the data and the amount of patients that are fearful of coming into a, a clinic or a hospital setting even in the midst of a heart attack. And you know, that's, that's what I deal with in my space is patients are having heart attacks. They, they're fearful of coming in because of COVID and the, the risks that are involved with that. So, you know, they want us there to help things run smoothly. And, you know, I, I, I tell young reps all the time, you're there more for the staff than the surgeon the majority of the time. So if you can help the staff be streamlined and efficient, then the physician or surgeon is going to feel that effect too. So, you know, we're usually there for the staff just as much as we are for the, for the physician. So they want us there for sure. It's just a matter of, you know, if we're allowed in, honestly. Got it. So when you say there for the staff to help things run smoothly and efficiently, speak to that a little bit. What are you referring to? So, you know, I get this question a lot about people who don't know about this industry sure. at all. And, you know, you know, even my own family, when I first started out in this industry out of college, you know, I have a degree in zoology from Auburn University. And they're like, what are you doing in the operating room? You know, so the way that I put it is this. My job is to be an expert at my product and the techniques that surround it. The doctor knows how to do the surgery but he may or may not know how to use my product to accomplish that, he or she. So I am there to provide a benefit and a tool when it comes to using my products to uh, make sure that we have uh, good outcomes for the patient when it comes to the products being used correctly. You know, you're there to answer problems if something happens, you know, uh, surgery is not perfect. It's an extremely delicate process that, you know, takes, hours and hours and hours to even get close to perfecting. And that's why these doctors are usually in the top 1% of, of intellect. It's just, you know, it, it's not easy stuff. And my job is to be an encyclopedia of how everybody in the region does surgery certain ways with certain products. So, and in that process, the staff is absolutely huge when it comes to successful outcomes for surgeries and, and procedures. You know, if you don't have staff that know what they're doing um, or can help assist the surgeon uh, or physician in times where they need them, then it's just as much of a hindrance as you, if you have a bad surgeon. So, know. you know, the, the staff are going to know much less about my products mm -hmm. and the procedures that surround them than the physicians are. So if I can help the staff by being two steps ahead of the surgeon when it comes to what he or she is going to be doing next or what to expect or, you know, cutting off problems while you see them happening before they get too bad, then you've done your job. Got, so. it. Got it. And does that require a lot of time before the procedures to sit with the staff and go over things? It, it's, it's, it varies. Um, some cases are more technical than others. Um, and it all depends on the, on the scenario. So if you have new staff, absolutely. You know, if you are new to the staff, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of the time, and I say 99% of the time, there should be some basic conversation that the medical device rep is having with the staff before the patient gets in the room. 
Sure. You know, from a simple, hey, how are you? This is what we're doing today, right? And which, you know, affirms, yes, this is what we're doing. And then if they have questions, it's an opportune time for them to ask without the surgeon being there to judge them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just uh, you should always have some type of conversation. It doesn't have to be um, sitting down and going through uh, an encyclopedia to, to figure it out. Right. But yes, absolutely. There should, I mean, you should be in constant communication with every person in that room from the minute you see them when you walk in the facility until the moment the patient has left the room. Absolutely. Got it. it. And as far as hours, you know, you said that towards the end of the day, that's when a lot of the surgeons don't have as many procedures. What Mm -hmm. are your days and night, what are your nights and weekends look like in this space? (laughs) Well, if you have a family, they are uh, crowded, that's for sure. Um, you know, between bedtime and dinner and nighttime routine and trying to take a breath for yourself, um, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of time. But early on in your career, and, and this is advice that I like to pass on, and you find a way to do it later in your life, even when you have kids and families, is you need to be digesting information 24-7. I'm not saying that you don't need to have a life or have a, a nice, you know, work life balance, right? That's the big, the big catchphrase, but you need to be able to be ahead of the curve when it comes to what is going on in your industry, whether it's your specific product and company or just the industry in general, when it comes to what's being done, that's new, what cool product technique, or, you know, what's my competition doing, or, you know, even if it's a sales target type, uh, exercise, you should be always digesting something. And the nighttime is the easiest part of that. You know, I also usually say that I have more sales after five o'clock in the afternoon than I did most of the other times of the day, because most people pack up and go home, including the reps. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, it, it's a tough life. You're up early and you're at it early. You're, you know, by 730, you usually you've done a couple procedures and you're exhausted mm-hmm. mentally and, you know, physically, but you know, if you don't continue to push, then somebody else is going to do it and they're just going to out push you. And you're not going to get ahead when it comes to being educated and being what I call a consultant in your field. And that's what you need to be as a true consultant and not just a box opener. That's not what we need. need. Speak to that a little bit regarding the competition. You know, you said somebody can pretty much outwork you. (laughs) What's that like in the field, the competition? You know, there's a reason why it's tough to get in this industry. It's it's cutthroat and it's it's tough work. Um, it's not that it's not doable and that it's hard. It's just every single person is going to be a hard worker. Every single person is going to have some of those key phrases that you see in interviews that, you know, I'm a hard worker, I'm punctual, you know, I'm, I'm the first one to leave or the first one to get there, last one to leave, you know, fantastic. That's what you're supposed to have. I shouldn't ask, <laughs> right. I shouldn't ask you that. You know, right. my candidates for this position should automatically have that in their sure. in their repertoire. Yeah. But how are you going to think outside the box? How are you going to how are you going to get an orthopedic surgeon mm-hmm. or a vascular surgeon to look at you and agree with your consideration and recommendation as if you were one of their colleagues? Yeah. That's yeah. the that's the ultimate get is for them to treat you like it like an equal because yeah. then you know you've made it. You've done your job. They believe what you say and because you, you know, not because you're lying, but um, you know, and the competition, you know, it's just part of it. And it, you know, competition is good and for everybody, for companies, for, for capitalism, it, it, it's fantastic. It drives the needle forward. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to patients and patient care, it's even better. If you have competition at a corporate level, it allows for technology and boundaries to continue to be pushed that allow for uh, amazing technologies and robotics right. and, right. you know, artificial intelligence. So, you know, but when it comes to a uh, very minute level and me interacting with my competitors day to day, it's an interesting dynamic and it toughens you up as a person. It also tests how you are as a person and your character and whether or not you really should be in this industry or not, because don't get me wrong, there are plenty of people who make make bad names of themselves and put stains on the industry because they do things the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, you find that any in any part of business and any part of life, and it's no different in medical device. 
we just have fancier terms around it and you know we're in scrubs and and operating rooms doing it but you know you know competition is good and it can it can help drive you the right way but it also can push you out because there's there's going to be somebody that wants it bad enough that they will outwork you if they have to Mm -hmm. um and it's you know it's just that it's an everyday process and that's when people miss out is when they become complacent Mm -hmm. and don't think they need to try to further themselves every single day Mm -hmm. that you're you're going to get outworked it's just simple and then you know, then it's just the, the black and white of it, you might not even hit your number or your quota, and then you're just going to be out of a job. So, I mean, that's just the, the basic part of it. You know what? Give, right. give us an example, because I, w- I really want to paint this picture. I, I love what you're talking about right now. Give us an example of what it really means to be outworked, and especially when you're talking about how your competition kind of kind of tests you to the point where you really have to oh, ask yeah. yourself, am I supposed to be here or not? <laughs> give us an example of what that actually looks like. <laughs> So uh, in the orthopedic space, it's, it's a little more easy to give some good examples. Sure. Um, the vascular space is, is a whole different realm that I've learned. And, um, you know, it's interesting to uh, see the, the cooperation in a vascular lab a little bit more so than orthopedics. But, you know, in, in orthopedics, I did sports medicine for a very, very long time. Sure. And in those procedures in general, um, it is not, it is not abnormal to have, uh, you know, three or four reps in the room or around the room. Same and that's, that's not, not a bad thing. It's just, you know, everybody has something that Dr. X, Y, Z might want to use. Mm-hmm. Um, and a good example of, of competition pushing you out is something as simple as you don't have product A for Dr. B. And you're there in the case and, you know, Dr. B says, you know, okay, Steele, I need, I need product A to continue doing this product. And you haven't done your due diligence and your homework to bring it to the procedure. Um, or you, you made, you didn't make sure it was there, whatever the scenario is. And, you know, your rep across the room, your competition goes, you know, well, Dr. B, I have this solution that does the same thing that I have here with me. Yeah. And you would be surprised at how something so simple and not even with the competitor being rude or, right. um, you know, I mean, he, he just answered a question. Right. Not, not being combative. Or, just, just, yeah. I mean, just not confrontational at solution. all. Yeah. But all of a sudden the, the cascade and the downstream effect that might have, you might've just lost that surgeon. Wow. And you, you don't, and you don't even know it. And that, that happens multiple times a day every single day in orthopedics it's just how it's it's how cutthroat it is so if you're not on top of it yeah if you don't have four or five solutions for every solution that you have yeah and their backups then somebody does somebody does so um i mean there there are millions of examples um that i could get into but it's just if you don't do your due diligence and and make sure you are setting yourself apart in every single way, every single day, mm-hmm. somebody's going to find a way in. That's just their job. I mean, I'm doing the same thing. That's my job is to find a way to push other people out yeah. so I can be there. No, I, I love it, Steele. I mean, one, one thing I love about, about your background is, you know, you've, you've done a lot. <laughs> you've done a lot. You've experienced so many different <laughs> spaces within medical device sales. But I, w- I want to ask you one question before we get into some of your own, you know, history. How do you balance this? Because, uh, I mean, th- the, the picture you've painted so far is, for lack of a better phrase, it's it's a bit high strung. I mean, you you have to be on. You have That's to be nice, on, yeah. right, at all times. Oh, yeah. how, and, and, and considering how long you've been in the game, how, what have you, what helps you balance it all and, and keeps you at this, this even killed way of being that allows you to continue to go out there day in, day out and give it your best? Well, I'm glad you think I'm even keeled. <laughs> Nobody, including my wife, who's in the other room, would agree with you at all. So um, it is, but it, it, it is how you manage being not even keeled uh, that really determines whether or not you're going to make it in this industry. Um, sure. High strong is being nice. It is, it is, and that's just part of the industry. You're, the operating room and the procedure rooms are a extremely tough environment. You know, they're, they're, high strung they're intense it's you know a lot of a lot of stress because you're dealing with patients lives right. and you know i know i hate to to boil it down to that but that's how it really is some I mean some simple procedures patients don't make it out of 
And if you're in that room, a part of it, then it, it changes you. So, you know, me personally, you know, I, I was in the operating room early in college um, at some pretty basic levels. I was an orderly just cleaning rooms after procedures and doing stocking and stuff. And I worked my way into a position as a, uh, what they call a first assist. So I was just somebody that assisted in procedures um, and was able to help uh, surgeons retract and, you know, get instruments and do some of the things. And so I cut my teeth pretty early and, you know, you, you have to build a thick skin. You know, you, you don't, need to have too many emotions that are going to hinder you from, from moving on. If you take things too personal uh, in this industry, you're not going to, you're not going to survive very long. And then if you translate that to uh, medical sales, the actual sales side of it, you know, people talk all the time about getting used to hearing no. And, you know, that's where it starts is being able to build your skin up to where it's thick enough that you can take the hit Mm -hmm. and move on and not let it affect you. So, you know, I personally started early and kind of built it up to where I didn't have too many emotions when it came to the to the environment. But aside from that, it's how you manage your stress and your reactions that will determine how successful you really are in this industry. And as an early sales rep, I was not overly great at it. I, you know, I'm, I'm a hot headed person in general, and I'm extremely competitive. And when I would lose, I, I got mad about it. And you just learn really quickly to, you know, learn from what has happened, the scenario, move on and try not to make the same mistake again uh, and just try to sell better. And that's fine. If you literally can just look at somebody and say, okay, you outsold me today, I'll see you tomorrow. Then, <laughs> then you'll do much better at it. But Ultimately, you know, my advice is you have to have an outlet. You absolutely have to have an outlet. You have to have time set aside, whether it's every single day or once a week or once a month where you, you let go. Um, you know, we are attached to our cell phones, you know, in the old days in early days when I started, it was pagers, Mm -hmm. you know, we are attached to these things 24 seven and it's our livelihood. It's our paycheck, you know, and with, social media and technology, it doesn't help because we're just attached to them. Right, right. So you have to find a way to disconnect and to leave work behind you and not think about it. I mean, if, you know, if you're married or you have a significant other, take them, go somewhere. If exercise is your thing, do that. You have, you have to have that. Sure. Otherwise you are going to kill yourself. The stress is just too much. Um, but aside from that, if you have your, your time, and you allow yourself time to forget about work a certain amount per day, per week, per month, whatever it is, then you just have to learn to not take things so seriously yeah. when it comes to, you know, hearing no and, and losing. I mean, your job is very serious. I mean, patients' lives are, are a very, very serious thing. But if you can relax a little bit, you know, tell a joke here and there. And, you know, I'm the funny guy when it comes to the operating room. I mean, I, I know when to be quiet. Yeah. But uh, you know, that's just my thing. It, I bring some humor to the room, to the situation, try to make people realize that I'm there to help and not to be a, a burden. Right. Um, you know, then you'll be fine. I mean, it's just, it's about how you manage it. I mean, if you, if you blow up and take things too personal and get super competitive and, you know, there's people that are still in the industry that do all these things, it's off putting. And eventually everything comes back to get you in this industry. It, it might not be right away. Right but it will find its way back and you will be out of the job mm-hmm. and probably out of the industry as a whole. It's, it's only a couple strikes and, you know, it, eventually there's no coming back from it. You just need to find another profession. So. Wow. Wow. And I, and I take it, you probably have experienced a number of people that, uh, that had to end up going that route. Oh yeah. Okay. A few that I helped, I helped push that route out. They didn't need to be in the <laughs> okay. industry. So yeah. What what are the, what would you say are the telltale signs that I mean you you you've laid out a lot for for the audience right now in in what you should and should not have, but sure. just maybe maybe you know take it back to when you were were making you know hiring decisions. What would you say are telltale signs that you know what mm, this this is probably not going to work for <laughs> this, this individual? A lot of uh, individual responses or characteristics when it comes to the person being much more consumed with I than we, um, the majority of the time, these are team positions and, and some form or facet. I mean, I, I'm 
much more singular now than I was in orthopedics, but I still have a team sure. and we all need each other to thrive and survive. But, you know, candidates and people who were very concerned with themselves and, and, and that's pretty obvious when you talk to people about, you know, give me some stories about your background and certain scenarios, you can, you can see selfish people pretty easily. Um, and me personally, I don't, I don't like selfish people in this industry. You know, I, I try to make people understand that the patient comes first in every decision you need to make. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, then you need to find another, another industry to be in another position to be in. Having humility is something that's a, a huge important thing in this industry. And, you know, I'll be the first one to say, you know, it took me, it took me time to, to learn humility and especially when it came to medical device. So I'm not naive to think that it's necessarily not learned versus completely inherent. But people who are inherently humble, uh, it's easy to tell and vice versa, people who just are inherently not and don't have the ability or the adaptability to become humble. Um, You know, a lot of times it's something that you learn by being beat down or by being told no or by losing a big deal, uh, losing a doctor, you know, that's just life. Mm -hmm. But those people who you can tell from an early onset that are humble and don't draw attention to it, those are traits that you absolutely want to want to feed out and try to have in your in your team uh, and in your corporation as a must. It's if you don't have humility in some form or fashion in medical device, uh, you're going to hate it because you're not going to win everything and right. you're going to lose in a big show sometimes and it's right. going to hurt and it's going to be embarrassing, but you know, it's just how it is. This industry, you need to learn to say, okay, I lost today. That's fine. I'll, I'll try to win another one and, and move on. And you know what that, that actually makes me want to ask you a question, you know? So one thing that I hear from a lot of medical device uh, professionals is that, that time when a surgeon's yelling at you or, you're just you're you're the enemy of the room for whatever. Oh, yeah. How oh, often yeah. how often does that happen, and how do you typically <laughs> navigate those situations? You know, me me five six even seven eight years ago uh, would have given you probably a different answer. I have a, a much fonder respect for surgeons now um, at the point in my life and my career where I'm at now. But you know, on the totem pole of the operating room, the medical device rep is usually at the bottom, and we are extremely important to the to the smooth running of some of these procedures and stuff. But you know, we are the person that is just at the bottom of the chain. You know, the patients at the top and the doctors right there next to them, and the staff supporting the outcome of the patient are all above us, and we're just there supporting them. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily a, a derogative thing. It's just we are below the staff, which is below right. the surgeon, which is below the patient. Got it. So um, you know. Surgery is a stressful thing. And these physicians and these surgeons have patients' lives in their hands. They have looked these people in the eye and told them, I will take care of you. Mm-hmm. I will fix you. I will help you get back to normal so you can go back to work, so you can walk, so you can eat, whatever the example is. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of responsibility. And that's that's why their oath is not something to be taken lightly. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's just, it feeds into why being a doctor is such a big deal and such a hard thing to do because it just is, you, you have a lot of power, um, as a surgeon specifically because you're cutting on people and, and altering or trying to fix people. Um, so it's a stressful thing. And sometimes that just trickles down, you know, these, these doctors, even if you just take their personal lives out of it, which they're people too, they have, you know, kids and, debt and right, life right, and right just like all of us you right know, we have we all have those problems and or those scenarios and situations um you know surgery can get stressful to them sometimes and they you know surgeons are taught at least good surgeons are taught in stressful situations to stop what they're doing as long as the patient is not needing to be you know stopped from bleeding or something and take a minute and breathe and fall back on their training Mm-hmm. And, you know, but when they don't do that, you know, you in the room and everybody else is just a part of the scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like I said, you being in the bottom of the totem pole, you're just more expendable sometimes than sure. nurse, nurse Betty, they have to see every single day. Sure. So, um, you know, again, this all falls back into being able to have a thick skin 
and not take anything personal. You know, I've had things thrown at me and I've had things yelled at me and said to me that were hurtful and, and not professional and just bad. But, you know, a surgeon 99.9% of the time is going to look at you and apologize, even if not right then, you know, once the stress is passed and they're done and you're going to say, you know, doc, look, that I understand, you know, this is stressful. I'm, I'm here to help. Okay. So, you know, it's just, it's just how it is yeah. in the industry. They don't mean it. Yep. I don't think you know, <laughs> if they do, you might want to avoid, avoid them and their business, but um, it's just a, it's just a part of the stressful part of this job. And that's again, why you have to think really hard about what you're doing here and you have to continue to put the patient first. And Makes sense. if you don't, you're not going to stick in that room when that guy's yelling at you and, and continue to press them on why they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, doc, make sure you do this doc, make sure you do that. And, um, you know, it's tough. It's tough. Sometimes you learn to grow into it. Otherwise you just don't and you move on. So, right. right. Got it. Got it. You see, I told you we were going to get into the details, the day to day from the home office to the cath lab. You know what I liked about what Steele was really getting into. He really does embody the true definition of what it means to be about the patient. Uh, he probably referenced it, uh, gosh, three, four, five times in this episode. And when anybody that wants to get into this industry, when you think about what you're getting yourself into, every device representative, you know, every device professional that I've ever spoken with, they all have the same theme, which is you need to know that your sole goal is to improve patient outcomes. And, and through that, you're helping the staff be streamlined and, and highly efficient. And that's exactly what Steele talked about. And he talked about, you know, the, the role of the sales rep uh, when it comes to stents and how he can be the ultimate resource. You know, one thing I like that he referenced is I need to be that encyclopedia, which makes a lot of sense. Of course, he wants the surgeons that he's working with to see him as an equal. But then you think, well, he didn't go to med school. So how is that going to happen? But he has the opportunity to see how different the same procedure is done and what's considered and what's used and how his product fits into all of it. So he's bringing a wealth of knowledge to all of these providers and they're respecting him for it. And it's allowing him to be that encyclopedia he spoke about. And another thing that he referenced, the importance of training yourself to digest information 24-7. Now. That can be taken all sorts of ways. <laughs> Does that mean that you do nothing but read a book at all times when you're not working, if you're in the medical device sales space? I, I don't believe so. But what it does mean, you're, you're, you're really making, getting new information, processing the new information, you know, applying it to your knowledge, applying it to your mind as something that you actually know, you're making that a regular practice. You're going above and beyond your job to make that a regular practice. And when you do that, consistently, it's always going to put you at an advantage amongst those that you're, that you're selling against. I mean, when you think about it, it's a very competitive space. So you got to be on point. And to be on point means you understand what's going on. You're ahead of your field as far as the technology, and you know how providers are using it. And then another thing that I love that's, that still talked about uh, that I think is so important, not just for device sales, but for any of these positions and for any of the leadership positions as well, is managing your stress and reactions. Uh, we, we got into that a little bit. And, you know, I, I pointed out how still can all, often can come off like he's just even killed person. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm not even killed at all. Actually, I'm the opposite. But what I do, uh, what I practice when I try to be diligent in is managing how how I can be that way. And that really boils down to managing stress and having not only knowing how to manage stress when you're in the right in the middle of things, but knowing how to manage stress when you're outside of work and knowing what you need to bring into your life to help you relax, to help you refocus, to help you recharge, to help you regroup so that you can actually go back and be effective in this space. This was a great episode. Uh, there's a lot to share. There's a lot to learn. And, and this is another reason why we've broken it up into two parts. Uh, the part you heard this week was the part about all the rigor of the job, 
when it comes to working in the cardio space and the ortho space. Uh, Steele's experience when it came to 10 and 9 versus W2 and the different things he learned around it. Next week, we're going to get into Steele's background. Where did he work? Where did he come from? And what was this 1099 life that he started out with? What was it really like for him? And we're going to get into the details of that next week. So if you're someone that you've been listening to these episodes and you're thinking, you know what, I really want to make a move. I want to get myself into a medical sales role. Maybe it's a medical device sales role in the North Peak space or the cardio space. Or maybe it's something like a pharmaceutical sales role or genetic testing sales role or even a molecular sales role. If you're someone that wants to get into one of those types of roles, you need to visit EvolveYourSuccess.com and select Attain a Medical Sales Role. Learn about our program that we've designed called the Medical Sales Career Builder that will help you get into the position you want to get into. And for those of you that Maybe you're farther along in the process. Maybe you've been interviewing, but for some reason you haven't been able to close. Or maybe you know that you've been, you know how to present yourself, but it's been a while since you've interviewed and you're not sure if you remember everything you're supposed to do to make sure you secure that position. Come visit us at evarvasuccess.com or reach out to me on LinkedIn, Samuel Adeyinka, and let's have a conversation. You can speak to me directly if I'm available or you can speak to one of my Uh, client specialists, and they will talk to you, myself, or they will talk to you about the different resources we have to get you into the position you want to get into. It's 2021. It's a brand new start with brand new opportunities. And guess what? Companies are hiring right now. So you want to take full advantage and step into the position that you believe you deserve. And for those of you that are trying to improve your performance, You've said, you know what, this year I'm going to deliver. I want to deliver above and beyond anything I've done before. Again, visit EvolveySuccess.com, select Improve Sales Performance, or find us on LinkedIn, send us a message, and get in contact with us, and let's talk about our resources that can help you exceed your sales goals, get yourself where you want to be within your career, within your organization, and really see amazing things come to fruition in 2021. As always, I appreciate all of you for taking the time to listen to the Medical Sales Podcast. We want to bring you great information, great guests, great insight, so that you can go back out there and get the position you want, live the career you dream of, and lead the way you want to lead. Make sure you stay tuned for another episode next week of the Medical Sales Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.